Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a conversation this evening on the most consequential relationship in the world today, of course, that is between the US and China. And it couldn't be more timely. The Biden administration has done more on Asia this May, which also happens to be, by the way, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, then in its entire first year in office. Against the backdrop of the Ukraine war, a flurry of Asia-focused di diplomatic initiatives in recent weeks started with the White House hosting a special summit with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations to make up for lost time, to reaffirm US commitments to the region and its importance to US national security interests. Biden's first trip to Asia as president soon followed, visiting South Korea and Japan, where he launched the new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF with 13 inaugural members, notably without Taiwan, Myanmar, and China-friendly Cambodia and Laos. The new partners represent about 40% of the world's GDP. The initiatives are part of a three-pronged approach to China that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken unveiled in a speech just last Thursday, which includes investing at home, aligning with allies, and competing with China. Build as the administration's grand strategy toward China, we will hear from our speakers whether Blinken's remarks made the grade. As we all know, we are going through some of the most challenging times in the history of US-China relations. The era of engagement with China has come to a definitive close. But can we compete without bringing on catastrophe? As Russia's invasion of the Ukraine raises the specter of nuclear war, and recent war gaming exercises revealed that conflict over Taiwan could go nuclear. Are we seeing a Cold War redux? These are very important questions. Let me then briefly introduce our three speakers. Not too briefly, because they're too experienced and too expert. All I can say is these are three China experts par excellence. First, David M. Lampton, whose friends call him Mike, is Professor Emeritus of China Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Mike's interest in China was kindled by a high school teacher. He put himself through Stanford University as an undergraduate working as a firefighter and was a medic in the US Army Reserve before earning his PhD from Stanford University ever since. He has specialized in Chinese politics and US-China relations at, as both an educator and an author of many, many books, too many to count, including his latest, Rivers of Iron, Railroads, and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia. He has also written for many journals and publications, including two editions of FPA's Great Decisions, and it is great, America's largest discussion program on world affairs. FPA, you should be proud. Yes. Mike spent a decade as president of National Committee on US-China Relations, whose perennial vice president is here, 
Um, and five as chairman of Asia Foundation. I'm very proud to claim him also as a member of the Advisory Council at the US China Education Trust. Next, we have Paul G. Clifford, a non-resident senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, who first lived in China as a student in 1973. That's early. Mm, British. Earning his PhD, ah, British, OK. Earning his PhD in modern Chinese history at the University of London. He worked in China as a corporate banker and at a global US high technology firm where he managed its strategic relationship with the China Development Bank. In China, he has advised large state-owned enterprises on pre-IPO restructuring, private Chinese firms on growth strategies, and multinational corporations on market entry. After Sichuan's 2008 earthquake, he worked on networks for remote healthcare and education. He has also consulted elsewhere in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. Where have you not been? And has taught at universities in Mexico, the UK, and the US. With over 30 years of China experience in technology, management consulting, and finance, Paul Clifford documented the twists and turns of China's rise in his re most recent book, The China Paradox, at the front line of economic transformation. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Ambassador Jay Stapleton Roy, who is st speaking to us from Washington, Stape? Yes. Known as Stape, he was born in China and spent much of his youth there during the upheavals of World War II and the Communist Revolution, where he watched the battle for Shanghai from the roof of his school. Stape, an anecdote. I was watching the same on the roof of our house. So we were in Shanghai together as very young people, <laughs> no longer young. Uh, he joined the US Foreign Service immediately after graduating from Princeton in 1956. During his 45-year career, State participated in the secret negotiations that led to the establishment of US-China diplomatic relations and served as the US ambassador to Singapore, China, and Indonesia before his final post as the Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research. State retired in 2001 with the rank of career ambassador, the highest in, in the service. In 2008, State became the founding director emeritus of the Kissinger Institute on China and the US. He also, of course, holds other leadership roles in various councils and institutions. Without further ado, Mike, I think you're up. Well, thank you very much, and thank all of you for uh, coming and giving us an opportunity to test our ideas on, on all of you. I want to thank FBA and Dame Sackler and my colleagues for, uh, you know, in your case, putting the program together and us having the opportunity to exchange views with ourselves and you as well. So I couldn't be more pleased to be here. I think if I would leave you with a takeaway point, and I'm, I'm basically an optimistic person, but I also try to be realistic, and I'm afraid I'm leaning in the direction of realism uh, here at this particular uh, era. I think, put it bluntly, we are sleepwalking into a potential high level of conflict with China. Over what time frame, how fast, is certainly not predetermined, but that's the trajectory we're on. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as citizens and uh, intellectuals, we ought to be thinking of all the ways we can change that trajectory and make it more positive, because as Julia said, the, the world is really depending on us to manage this relationship, and by us, I mean Americans and Chinese. And while I might comment more on American policy sometimes than Chinese, 
I think China has no less responsibility than us and no more blame than us for the current condition of the relationship. Um, I think how unparalleled the situation is is simply if you contemplate the fact that two nuclear powers have never had a kinetic conflict. We came very close to that in October of 1962. But when we start talking about missiles hitting Guam or striking deep into China with missiles, you are talking about a conflict between two nuclear powers, and that has not happened. I don't think the American consciousness is quite caught up with the reality of, of the capabilities that we both uh, have. Also, I would just uh, sort of have a definitional statement of the situation. If you look at uh, the sort of 50 years of, uh, since Nixon, I would say a good chunk of that period, 40 years, was what I would, our policy was reassuring each other that we would make space in the international system and gradually improve relations over time. It was reassurance was our policy. We, in the last 10, 12 years, have changed, and that by we, I mean China and the U.S., to a policy of deterrence. And deterrence is about threat whether it's economic, diplomatic, uh, or obviously uh, military. The, the very root of our respective policies uh, is, has a different objective. No longer reassurance, but in fact deterrence through threat. Now what I'd like to do just to get the discussion going and sort of make a broad umbrella is make three points and they all deserve discussion. I will make them a little more sharply than even I would after we take off the rough edges. But for the sake of clarity, let me make three points. First of all, I think our traditional relationship since Nixon and it evolved over all the intervening administrations till Trump was sort of a three-legged stool. It was a tripod and that tripod was, uh, uh, we uh, were strategic interests, uh, military balance, uh, the Soviet Union and our attempt to deter the Soviet Union played a big role, but it was a military dimension of the relationship. And we sold weapons and transferred intelligence and it was a very com increasingly complex relationship. The second uh, leg on this tripod was economic, and that grew over time, particularly after China joined the WTO in 2001. And then there was the diplomatic uh, leg and cultural and educational, and that drew, uh, grew enormously. We were talking about the, the, uh, the museum in, in Beijing. I was talking about Hopkins Nanjing Center for 36 years we've run in Nanjing. There were huge investments in the uh, education and cultural domain that I think were good for everybody, just to not put too fine a point on it. But the point is that that three-legged stool, every leg in the stool is becoming weaker. And as one becomes weaker, it makes the other weaker. Let me just make an example. As our strategic relationship becomes more distrustful, of course, we slap on uh, export controls. We slap on investment controls. That weakens the economic relationship. Also, we, uh, the federal government, uh, in an exercise of its due responsibilities, has to become more mindful of what Chinese students are doing in American laboratories on universities. And so it begins to affect the educational relationship. So my first point is, this is a comprehensive deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship, and one piece of the process affects the other. My second point is, and it gets to the more post, or the whole Ukraine and everything that that stands for, uh, there's been, a, I would say, an acceleration in the deterioration of our relationship in this period of, we'll call it the Ukraine war. And uh, let me just indicate some of the dimensions. On February 4th of this year, in uh, Beijing, Putin uh, met with Xi, went to the uh, Winter Olympics, uh, one of the relatively few major world leaders who did so, uh, and they issued a joint statement. And the operative parts, I invite you to go read it, 
But the operative phrase that uh, I think are important is it proclaimed a no limits partnership. And even more significant than that, it says there are no forbidden areas of cooperation between Russia and China. Uh, and this was just on the eve, well, uh, 20 days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so it raises the issue of what Xi Jinping knew. Did he give a green light, so to speak? He was quite concerned that there not be an invasion of Ukraine by Russia while he's trying to conduct the, uh, the Olympic Games. He, he obviously achieved that objective, but it looks as though he certainly didn't try to dissuade, if it was dissuadable, uh, Mr. Putin. But the point is, there was this document and joint statement. That's the, the, the core point. And what is uh, notable about that is once the invasion happened, China did not articulate the policy that has guided it since the early 1950s, which is the inviolability of the sovereignty of nations as recognized by the United Nations. China did not as it is almost in every other case, there are a couple of exceptions, but basically has always, sanctity of sovereignty has been the key point. Well, uh, that's the basis of the international system as we know it today. So it raises, its, 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 uh, raises the issue about the commitment of China to the, international, the fundamental principle of the international system. And my point, is that this greatly affected in a very negative way the view of the Biden, and I'm not limited perhaps to the Biden administration, but had a deep scarring effect on the Biden administration. And that gets me to my third point, which is, it was mentioned by Julia briefly, was the Blinken speech, Secretary of State Blinken speech, that was, I think, a summary, so to speak, of the reevaluation of China policy in the new administration. He delivered that speech on May 26th. I encourage you all to go and read that speech. Uh, obviously, a lot of work and thought went into it. I'm not diminishing it. But what I would like to call your attention to about that speech is that it is very much like a very famous document in April, April 14th, 1950, which was called NSC 68, National Security Council Policy Papers, drawn up by Paul Nitze. But it basically was the roadmap for the US waging of the Cold War and containment. Truman adopted it as the administration policy, then the Korean War broke out, and this became the roadmap. The only point I want to leave you with at this moment is Blinken's speech has remarkable parallelism in both content and structure to that earlier document. So you asked, are we headed for Cold War Redux? I'd say if you look at these two documents, you'd have to say, uh, that's a possibility uh, here. And what are some of the, uh, and I'll just wind up with this because I want to hear my colleagues, uh, what are some of these, these parallels? Well, first of all, uh, sets the goal that China, now China sort of substituted for the USSR in this latter document, but states the goal that we can't permit, in effect, Eurasia to be dominated by China. If you go to that earlier document, it stated the goal of not allowing Eurasia be dominated by the Soviet Union and also implied uh, China. Secondly, it, the, the uh, earlier document set the goal, uh, uh, an ideological goal. That is to say, now we're talking about democracy defeating authoritarianism is sort of the ideological. That earlier document said democracy versus communism. But the point is it had a very strong ideological goal in, I would say, both documents. Uh, if you talk about military threat, this current speech by Blinken talks about China is the pacing military challenge facing the US military. 
if you uh, talk about uh, why is it that we are concerned about Chinese foreign policy, and if you look at that earlier document, why we were concerned about the Soviet Union, because they didn't observe international norms and precepts, and that s similar phraseology is used in the uh, Blinken speech. If you look at the two documents, a great emphasis placed on allies and them increasing their defense spending, and we're all in it together kind of thing. And also, the doc, both documents placed great emphasis on controlling strategic technologies, resources, and in effect, outcompeting uh, the Soviet Union in technology and, of course, economics. So what I'm really trying to say is go back and look at the origins of the Cold War in its sort of uh, initial uh, statement and look at the current secretary's speech and you're going to be, I believe you will be struck by the parallelism. Now that does not mean, and this will be my last thought, does not mean that we're necessarily wrong. We, we can debate that, meaning the US. It doesn't mean we've misstated things. But I always remember back what uh, uh, George Kennan, the father of containment in the theory said. He said, I laid out what I thought was a diplomatic strategy and it became a military strategy. And so the last similarity in Blinken's speech with, uh, was essentially he said, this is a diplomatic strategy. That got, my, that got my attention. So thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion and my comments. Oh, Mike, that was excellent really. Uh, very spine chilling a little bit, uh, and, but also some hope. And I'm also full of hope. Uh -huh. you know, I want to work with the Chinese. Um, I want to thank uh, the FBA and uh, Noel Latif and also uh, uh, Ambassador Bloch for moderating this. Uh, it's a great honor to be in this great place um, ha having such a, an important discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, before I share my views, uh, which are going to be mostly on where we, how we got to be here, as opposed to what's happening you know, in, 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 in the, the Sea of Japan today. I'd love to answer that later, and Taiwan. Uh, I don't go into that in great deal in these uh, comments. But before I do so, I just wanted to say that uh, there may be some here who bristle at um, someone like me um, you know, offering suggestions on what the United States might or might not do. Um, but I can re reassure you that I'm speaking as an American citizen. Um, just like Fiona Hill, I have a, an accent, but not as uh, good as her Durham accent, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, secondly, I, you know, my position is that, that we need to have greater, bolder, deeper cooperation as a way to reverse the drift towards uh, you know, walking into conflict with China. And, but I, w I wish to stress that um, based on my decades of working in, in China, I have no love for the party state, the Chinese party state, and believe we need to be vigilant about China's actions and not put undue trust in the words of the, of the leaders, China's leaders. So the two little caveats. Um, much of the discussion is about the China threat, right? So I'm gonna pose the question, is there a threat? And then if so, what is that threat? <laughs> because that seems to be, that the word you could probably find Gould more times than any other word in relation to China at the moment. I mean, you can't write, get a book contract without presenting it as describing the China threat. You know, I did get a book contract without that, but all the other offers said, you must mention the China threat. And I find, I find that really, you know, the wrong way to start, you know, with the thinking. Um, I think Chinese academics and business leaders um, you know, most of whom are party leaders, will tell you quietly that both sides are to blame. Uh, they're, they're clearly stating that China is, is in part responsible for the terrible state of uh, US-China relations. They all know that, and many of them will tell you much in great detail what, what is wrong, the way China played the WTO card, all sorts of things which have you know, ruffled the feathers in the West. Um, so let's look at, what, you know, why we look at China as a threat. Uh, there is dismay in, in, uh, in the West over China in that its economic reforms haven't led to a political convergence or a softening. I think this hope was totally misplaced. Um, I mean, if you read Deng Xiaoping and others, they make it perfectly clear 
that the reforms are essential to keep the party in power, and no wavering from that will be permitted. So if you, if you think about what serves com Chinese Communist Party power, then that, that fits into the pick puzzle. That's why they help people get rich, but not just because they want to get people rich, but it's to stay in power. Um, I think that since uh, in the last 10 years, you mentioned the last you know, uh, yeah, 10 years, I think China has changed radically um, from what I knew and what I know now. Um, uh, and there's been a political hardening, that's true. And there's, there's an interesting blend, and I wrote about it in my recent book, of um, you know, party rule, yeah, more like Liu Xiaoqiism maybe, or a mild version of Maoism, plus neo-Confucianism. Xi Jinping really loves Wang Yangming, you know, the, the neo-Confucian scholar, and they're all, all wrapped up in the, you know, the uh, public surveillance brought by AI and, uh, uh, you know, uh, technology. And that, that makes it the toughest state that probably the world has any, ever seen. Um, and the, the party has reasserted its authority right through society in the economy, just, not just in the state sector, but in the private enterprise as well. There's been a heightened internal repression against the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, you know, civil rights lawyers, you name it. Um, and this has united the US right and left over China, which is extraordinary. I mean, the, the people in New York who would never you know, agree with Washington on a hard line on China, that has changed a lot, I'm afraid to say. Uh, and, and China's, I think, um, in China has stoked a belligerent high octane ethno nationalism, while soft power has just been thrown out of the window, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's very poor, anyway. And so China's bent on an adversarial relationship, you may think. And what they say is very harsh. You know, they say, we are the enemy. You know, US is the, the world, the threat to world peace. So, what does China think about the world? This is important because, um, you know, I've talked about mostly things going on in China. and. Um, that's t totally undeniable. But does it want to export its developmental model? Um, some Chinese, you can find them, including Xi, said at one stage, with full, full of hubris, saying, of course, we, you know, they can learn many things from us. Well, um, they've had to back off of that because it doesn't sell well in the world, that China wants to export its economic or political model. Um, and then what is the Belt and Road Initiative? Um, uh, my findings are that it is essentially a commercial and industrial play, utilizing skills developed during China's uh, um, um, industrialization, uh, building the infrastructure. Um, it's, it's absolutely true that Chinese political and cultural resources are used to shoehorn those investments into Africa and elsewhere. But at core, it remains an economic construct. The Chinese military, with some exceptions, and you, we know that you know there are eight eight bases in. Uh, military bases in uh, Djibouti, one of them being Chinese, but uh, um, mostly uh, China does not export its military. It got into great trouble in Sudan when there was a civil war. It had to uh, spend a huge amount of money getting its people out. Um, so it's not yet classic imperialism, in my view. And then there's Xi's global uh, security initiative, the Changchou Anquan Changyi. Again, the Changyi, the initiative, which really is it's just a proposal. They're using the word initiative when it's a much softer word. Proposal could be used. Um, uh, but it doesn't have any real content yet. Maybe Nicaragua. You know, so I think it's a very so soft thing, nothing of great consequence. It is true that China is dominating South China, the China Sea and drawing the noose closer on Taiwan. Uh, and there are concerns over the, you know, the, 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 the South Pacific. I mean, China is, is muscling in all over the place. But is it really a massive military threat around the world? To your point, I agree it's a massive threat to, you know, to Taiwan. Um, and then where's China today, you know, closing out a bit, um, its governance, its political governance is really flawed. And it's out of kilter with the needs of the modern economy, the knowledge economy. Um, the flawed, uh, that flawed governance can be seen in the zero COVID policy and also in the, how they handled SARS earlier when I was there. Um, the, the arrangements for political succession have been abandoned, greatly increasing Chinese political risk. It is true that Xi, since particularly in the second reign, has added a lot of energy to the high tech field in, in, in startups and pr putting private equity to work. Um, but 
and, you know, and AI and IoT and Internet of Things. Um, but China has absolutely serious weaknesses in its economy, um, in high-end semiconductor design and related equipment, um, providing the US with chokeholds, which they have been used, right? Uh, China's put up barriers uh, to knowledge transmission, obstructing its way up the knowledge ladder you know, to the knowledge society. And, and in many ways, China is, with these legacy institutions, and it's, it's some, something of an underperformer. You may think that's strange, but it is, and it has been all along. It could be much, much bigger. And you know, its productivity growth is actually faltering now. So um, my view is that China is a great power, but not by many measures, not yet a, a superpower. That, that may be an important point, because you know, there's a lot of confusion over that. So much is made of the technology threat, IPR threat. Um, that has happened. Look at what Huawei did with Cisco. I know, because I was in Cisco. Um, and also in Nort Nortel. Um, but stealing high-tech IP may help you catch up, but rarely does it get you really ahead with the speed of technology change. The fundamental reason the US has come down on China is that some areas of technology, in some areas, it is challenging US dominance. This hasn't happened since the Second World War and has created a psychological trauma within the US. There's no doubt. So the, the full wrath has been put on, on Huawei and Huawei is indeed highly linked to the Chinese party state. They should stop messing around on that. Huawei should just admit it, you know. That's, that's. But, um, but they, they've been playing catch up all this while, reverse engineering, imitating, yes, stealing IP. But that is not the reason they, that the US opposes Huawei. The reason is that finally Huawei is innovated and presents a competitive threat. Um, you know, we asked China um, to be a, a responsible stakeholder. That's a very important word. And that's exactly what Huawei did in a strange way. Not, not when it was stealing, but more recently. It participated in the global supply chain to an extent that it really shouldn't have. It didn't have its own operating system. It's now building one. It relied on Android. The government protested, you mustn't do that. You know, it's going to be fine. You know? Well, that was a mistake. They, were, they also developed their own 5G standards and took them to the ITU and other agencies and got them made, it, it, and with the international aid, developed a global standard. Way back 20, 15 years ago, China tried to develop a 3G standard of its own and totally failed <laughs> you know, to try and obstruct other people. So th this is a different way of... So I think we have to be very cautious about letting an autocratic state like China uh, uh, um, build our networks. But beyond that, I think we shouldn't be launching a wholesale attack on Huawei as a firm, including the maker of handsets. Um, I think the, the attack is part of a broader uh, uh, goal of, uh, to your point, uh, Mike, uh, you know, of return to containment, of a, a goal of slowing, disabling, and containing China's rise. Um, and some date that to the uh, Obama's pivot to Asia. I don't know if you agree, but it, it may, you know, that, that trend which Trump continued. Um, and I think it's a very dangerous game, and it's misguided, dangerous, and won't succeed. China will simply work harder to be self-reliant. So I'm deeply concerned about the, the, the notion of decoupling from the USA. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the concept of decoupling being inevitable or even desirable. I think large portions of the US industry and commerce share my concern. I mean, I know they do. They talk to me all the time. Looking at the long term, I strongly oppose a view of the world which foresees two camps um, defined by technology rivalry between the US and China. That would be a precursor to kinetic warfare. I don't, I'm not old enough to remember the, the pre-First World War, but I do know there was a rush, rush to, to war by Britain and Germany. Um, so my message to the US government is invest to compete, don't demonize Huawei, um, <laughs> which may be a little controversial, but um, I'm gonna say it. But we, we need to go beyond just competition. We need more cooperation. Um, if we focus just on competition, we may well slip towards adversarial relations. Remember, Blinken said adversarial, competitive, cooperation, those three buckets. I don't hear much about <laughs> um, you know, Kerry's uh, energy stuff or anything much at the moment. Do you hear anything? I don't. Um, that's why we need to find ways to cooperate with China, green technology, biotech, medical diagnostics, thorium reactors. 
we should revive the strategic economic di uh, dialogue that I actually participated in 15 years ago. So while we need to be vigilant, I think we need to encourage the world to permit China to take its full and legitimate place in the global economy. The alternative is just too risky and unacceptable. To achieve this, it would require rampant, a rejection of rampant exceptionalism on both sides. I mean, this is a horror story as an American, <laughs> on both sides. Um, but it also require the US to come to terms with and accept challenges to its absolute global hegemony. Uh, good evening. Three months ago, we marked the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China in February 1972. That event was a master stroke of diplomacy. It stunned the world and altered the course of the Cold War in a manner highly favorable to U.S. interests. Above all, it illustrated the vital importance for diplomacy of leaders who can rise above conventional thinking, spot opportunities, and act decisively in pursuit of a strategic objective, qualities that are all too rare in world history. At the moment, the United States and China are engaged in conventional thinking. They are talking past each other on important issues that affect the overall bilateral relationship. With respect to both words and actions, the explicit and implicit messages sent by each side are often interpreted by the other in a manner contrary to the intent of the sender. For this situation to exist between the two most consequential countries in the world is potentially dangerous and is contributing to the sharp worsening in U.S. PRC bilateral relations in recent years. The Biden administration has defined three components of the relationship, competition, cooperation, and confrontation. Its preference seems to be for steady state competition as the goal. In other words, to stabilize co competition as the main characteristic. In contrast, President Xi Jinping has insisted the goal should be peaceful coexistence. This is an important difference. This cloudy outlook will be significantly influenced by three factors. The first is the degree of hostility in domestic attitudes toward China and toward globalization more generally both of which are without precedent in the last half century, the degree of hostility. This is limiting the administration's willingness to consider trade agreements or other measures to improve relations with Beijing. The second is the slowness of the administration in defining an economic strategy for the Indo-Pacific. During President Biden's visit to Japan last week, the administration took a first step toward addressing this problem by launching the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity with a dozen Asian partners. This new trade agreement has the right membership, but is a pale shadow of what the Asian countries had been hoping for. The third factor is the Taiwan issue, which is an albatross around the neck of the administration. Senior officials from the president on down have not mastered the terminology of its own China policy. The one China framework agreed on when Washington and Beijing established diplomatic relations has stood the test of time. Within it, Taiwan has prospered as never before, achieving a per capita income equivalent to that of Canada. 10 years ago, cross-strait relations were thriving and tensions were low. This is no longer the case. President Xi Jinping has referred to Taiwan as a ticking time bomb. The principal reason for this downturn is the refusal of the current Taiwan government to acknowledge a one China framework in any form. The US government chose not to confront Taiwan over this issue, hoping that maintaining a status quo based on earlier affirmations of the 92 consensus on one China would be sufficient. This was a misreading of the importance of the one China principle in Beijing. In essence, we have been sucked into a vicious cycle in which Beijing increases military pressure on Taiwan to deter moves toward independence, and the United States responds by strengthening military ties to Taiwan, which Beijing considers a violation of the normalization arrangements. Breaking out of this vicious cycle should be a major policy goal for both Washington and Beijing. 
the United States claims to be adhering to a one-China policy based on the three joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and the six assurances. And yet President Biden stated bluntly during his just concluded visit to Japan that the United States will defend Taiwan if it is attacked. The language of the Taiwan Relations Act specifies that the President and the Congress shall determine in accordance with constitutional processes appropriate action by the United States in response to any such danger. Despite the importance of this issue, senior U.S. officials are sloppy and inconsistent in how they refer to Taiwan, sometimes calling it a country or an ally. Some examples follow. U.S. officials sometimes omit references to the three joint communiques as the basis for the U.S. one China policy, instead basing it on the Taiwan Relations Act, which omits any reference to a one China policy. Both the Trump and the Biden administrations have been tolerant of congressional actions inconsistent with the one China policy, including presidential signing of non-binding bills containing language incompatible with the administration's declared policy. To an objective outside observer, the United States of reality seems to be pursuing a one China, one Taiwan policy. The United States has significantly raised the level of officiality in dealing with Taiwan. Even though the government on Taiwan refuses to acknowledge any form of a one China framework, the United States continues to support more international space for Taiwan in the community of nations. In both the Trump and Biden administrations, Washington has sought to discourage countries still recognizing the Republic of China on Taiwan as the government of China from switching recognition to the PRC, whose government is recognized by the United States as the sole legal government of China. On the military front, U.S. defense officials have begun referring to the strategic importance of Taiwan for the United States in meeting the China challenge. PRC military operations near Taiwan or in Taiwan's air defense identification zone, intended to deter Taiwan from taking further steps toward independence, are interpreted by the United States as signaling Beijing's intent to invade Taiwan. U.S. military actions with respect to Taiwan are blurring the distinction between ensuring Taiwan has adequate defensive capabilities and treating Taiwan as a de facto military ally encountering China's growing military power. In conclusion, I need to point out the obvious, which is that Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine has fundamentally altered the international situation. It has also given rise to speculation as to whether Putin's bold action to recover what he claims to be former Russian territory in Ukraine will inspire Xi Jinping to advance his own timetable for recovery of Taiwan. It is premature to draw any firm conclusions on such questions, since it's still far from clear what the outcome in Ukraine will be. Nevertheless, it's vitally important for the United States not to misread the lessons we should draw from the conflict in Ukraine. Such misreading is made more likely by the determination of proponents of NATO eastward expansion to deny that this played any role in precipitating Russia's aggression in Ukraine. This is simply not supported by the record. In his Munich speech in 2007, Putin warned that NATO expansion represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. A year later, he repeated his warning that Moscow would view any attempt to expand NATO to Russia's borders as a direct threat. In 2008, current CIA Director Bill Burns, then the American ambassador to Moscow, wrote to Secretary of State Rice saying, quote, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests." Unquote. Such warnings, of course, in no way justify Putin's, Putin's blatant violation of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbor Ukraine, but they illustrate the danger of ignoring sharply drawn red lines by a powerful nuclear-armed country. 
Applying this lesson in the, in the Indo-Pacific, the reddest of red lines for Beijing is the formal separation of Taiwan from China. Beijing has made it crystal clear for decades, long before it began its military modernization process, that it will use military force if necessary to prevent that development. Now Beijing has formidable military capabilities for enforcing that red line, and yet the United States is inching in the direction of a one China, one Taiwan policy. Instead of seeking to reduce the threat, we are principally relying on military deterrence to forestall such action without halting the provocations. Given these considerations, it is safe to say that the crisis in Europe will have an impact on U.S.-China relations, whose nature will depend on, to a significant degree on the quality of U.S. diplomacy. And I would argue at the moment, we're refusing to understand the roots of these red lines and are edging to cross them. Very dangerous. We are indeed living in troubled times. Thank you. I think I'm a very bad timekeeper because the time has been slipping away from us. So I will reserve just one question uh, for, the, for the speakers to get the discussion going. And may we have your permission, no, since you are the head of FPA, that we started late. So may we at least have five minutes so we can have a question or two. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, Stape has really put us in the hot seat. So I would like to ask this question, since Ukraine is on everyone's mind. And although uh, Paul Clifford does not think Taiwan is as big an issue as some of us, uh, I would add that Taiwan may become as state forewarns, a really big issue. So no one has mentioned that uh, last Tuesday, China and Russia held their first joint military exercise since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in an apparent show of force as President Biden was visiting the region. What message does Beijing seem to be sending with this exercise? And more broadly, by being one of the few countries to side with Russia during the internationally condemned invasion of Ukraine. And the red lines are there, as they, as they put it. What are the implications for of a Sino-Russian partnership for future U.S. foreign policy. So whoever likes to start. Mike. Mike? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I think you're all aware that the, uh, there were uh, last week six bombers, I believe, four Russian and two Chinese, if I recall the, the count. And they flew into the South China Sea and between Japan and Korea. So I think the first message here is the strategy. I think China's uh, very disturbed by the U.S. strategy of mobilizing allies, increasing Japan to play a bigger role, trying to patch up relations between Korea and Japan so they can jointly play a bigger role. And uh, China's simply stating it doesn't like that policy. Secondly, I think there's a, 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 the red line on Taiwan. And that is, uh, to put it bluntly, I think China is sufficiently motivated on Taiwan. It will engage in conflict even if it loses in the short run. Uh, in other words, I think the regime believes it cannot survive a per what would look to the Chinese people to be a permanent change in the status towards separation, and they would actually choose to engage in a conflict they had no confidence of winning. Uh, also, I would just say in that regard, uh, I think they, uh, the, the Chinese wonder 
what is the level of commitment Americans really have underneath it all? We, we're, we, we tend to be a little more optimistic about interventions when they start than when they end or, or when they become more costly in human life and so forth. So I think the Chinese have no doubt we're serious about Taiwan and that President Biden was, in a sense, doing away with the ambiguity. But I would just say the Chinese are not ambiguous about the U.S. moving towards what Stape called, or at least the Chinese might think, is the one China, one Taiwan policy, which they said they would never accept. That's one of the few things they've actually been consistent about over the years. And by the way, I might add here that over nine months, Biden has said three times that we would go to the defense of right. Taiwan. And so people are debating whether this is a gaffe that the last time, and more and more people are saying it's not a gaffe. Hmm. It's that he is sending a strategic signal to Beijing and that China our policies have changed. That. Yeah, and China is very clear about that. <laughs> Yeah, um, first of all, I, I didn't talk about Taiwan because that, that was outside what I was meant to talk about, wanted to talk about. But I feel very strongly about Taiwan. I have many friends. I, I, I know Taiwan very well. I think that China's policy towards Taiwan hasn't really changed very much, actually. It's been consistent, um, and we know, you know we will take it back by force if necessary. I don't think short term they want to because it would be catastrophic. And the idea of them trying to capture TSMC's factory is not the issue at all. It's all about the, you know, the historical uh, uh, responsibility to take it back. You know? And so my concern is that, the, that Biden, for instance, yeah, he, this is not a gaffe. This is him playing a sm you know, very smart game. Um, but it's not. It's a very foolish game. Because the danger is that it will change the dynamics of the DPP and the KMT and give, you know, if the DPP gets kicked out in Taiwan or, or, or changes, it might go in the direction of independence. Who knows? So th the idea of making them into an ally that we can support them just fuels the idea that there might just be a road to independence. And that will be catastrophic diplomatically and politically, militarily. Um, just go on Russia very quickly. Um, I, I think China has, um, it's failed to do all the things we've been, I've been calling them up and e emailing my friends, tell the Politburo to, to you know, get America off your back by doing all the right things. They, they won't do it. But there are things that they have done. For instance, in the very early days, they talked about American defensive weapons going to Russia. Defensive, that's a signal. And then if you look at, um, I think it was uh, Jake Sullivan had seven hours with Yang Jiech, Seven hours, what were they talking about? Well, my bet is they were talking about SIC codes, all the things that China wants to know that you can still trade with without getting, it, getting secondary sanctions. So China, I think, is extreme, extremely cautious and wants to avoid, um, and like union pay, the Russians wanted union pay to help empower their card, credit cards. China said, no way, for a variety of reasons. So I, I, I think China, hasn't gone where we'd like it to go, but I, um, I, you know, I, I feel it's, um, it's taking a, a very nuanced position on the fence, if you like, but w without attracting countermeasures like um, secondary sanctions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, State, any further words on Ukraine uh, and Taiwan? Yes. Uh, no president should speak off the cuff about taking an action that could bring nuclear missiles raining down on American cities. Uh, that's simply not the right way to talk about it. This concept of strategic ambiguity is a misnomer. The Taiwan Relations Act is very explicit. It says that any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than Pacific means, including by boycotts or embargoes, is a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific and of grave concern to the United States. The president is directed to promptly inform Congress of any threat to the security of Taiwan and, in accordance with constitutional processes, to take appropriate action by the United States in response to any such danger. You can't conclude from that that the United States would not become involved. People compare this to the wanted 
Article 5 of NATO. What does the Article 5 of NATO says? It says that an attack on one is an attack on all, and they should take such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force. Well, I'm sorry, you can quibble about what, what these things mean. I think both of these agreements, one in the China Water Relations Act, which is not a treaty with another country, and one in the NATO agreement, indicates clearly that the United States will be involved if Taiwan is subjected to threats. Uh, so, given the fact that we're talking about dealing with major nuclear powers, it seems to me that the goal should be to adopt policies designed to make conflict unlikely. And that's why I put such emphasis on red lines. We ignored Russian red lines on Ukraine, and the result is a war in Ukraine. And if we ignore Chinese red lines on Taiwan, we are going to be in conflict with China over Taiwan. We can defend Taiwan. We cannot protect it. Look what's happening in Ukraine. We're defending it, and it's being destroyed. That doesn't in any way diminish the bravery and courage and will of the Ukraine people to defend themselves. But the fact of the matter is a conflict over Taiwan is the worst thing that could happen to Taiwan. And the U.S. policy should be designed to prevent the conflict, not to prepare for it. 